background of plant pathologist at the University of Kentucky. And by plant pathology, I mean that I work with plant disease and I work with um, diseases of hemp or one of my crops. So since 2014, we have been surveying hemp, um, different types of hemp, greenhouse, um, plastic culture, CBD, grain, fiber. We've been surveying hemp just to get an idea of what's out there. Because just like Tom said earlier, that, um, that the, the word on the street is that hemp is disease-free, insect-free, et cetera. Well, I can promise you it's not disease-free. In fact, it's been consuming a lot of my time lately. Uh, the more acreage that goes in, a lot more that we're seeing. So um, there are lots of diseases that affect hemp. And what we're trying to figure out at this point is which ones are major diseases that you should be worried about and which ones are just kind of an occasional pop-up. Um, what we can tell you that a lot of the diseases that you know as farmers are going to be those same diseases that do appear in your fields. So the diseases of corn and diseases of soybean or diseases of um, pasture grasses and forage, those things are showing right back up here. Um, and then we have, we have another layer, especially in CBD hemp. Now remember, three quarters of our hemp is CBD hemp. So a lot of these are coming from greenhouse production. So they're going from a greenhouse where there's a whole nother set of diseases and pests. I'll let the entomologists cover that. But so we can, we can start with those problems and then move them right into fields. So we've kind of got a double whammy that can go on there. And we're seeing lots of all of those things. And so when I talk, I'm going to kind of differentiate between greenhouse and field. Anybody here a greenhouse grower? No, no plug growers. Okay, anybody plan to be a, 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 a greenhouse production or a plug grower? No, okay, so um, yeah, we have one. So you really have to know, that's a, that's a floriculture um, discipline. So it's different than being a, you know, outdoor farmer. It's a whole nother set of, of parameters. But, so from a greenhouse, and I'm talking CBD at this point, so um, if you're coming in for plugs, so in a greenhouse situation, you're in a closed environment. So yes, you don't have outside predators coming in or outside pathogens coming in, in theory. You also don't have those predators coming in or those natural enemies coming in. So when we see populations flare in a greenhouse, it's usually pretty excessive. Um, so from a, from a disease standpoint, we have two real major um, diseases in greenhouse hemp, powdery mildew, is a big one, so everybody can see powdery mildew. It's pretty obvious when you see it. One thing about powdery mildew is that you, um, it kind of goes away once it gets into the field. This particular powdery mildew that we're dealing with, and we've done a lot of surveying in multiple states, it is um, pretty specific to a greenhouse environment. And once you come out into the field, it kind of goes away. But if you are a greenhouse grower, it matters because you can't sell diseased plants. So by law, by Kentucky law, you can't sell diseased plants. So, so growers still have to manage it in some way. The second thing we see a lot of is Pythium root rot. So any tobacco grower here knows Pythium root rot. Well, tobacco growers in flow beds, you're using TerraMaster to knock out that Pythium. You can't do that with hemp. You shouldn't be floating hemp anyway, by the way. Um, but so a lot of Pythium, Pythium in these greenhouses, Pythium in these styrofoam, these float trays. So we see a lot of Pythium out there. And anytime Pythium will get into that sterile or theoretically <laughs> sterile greenhouse environment, it will explode. So uh, Pythium or water molds, water molds meaning they need water to complete their life cycle. And there's nothing wetter than a greenhouse floor. There's nothing more humid than a closed greenhouse environment. So those are the two big diseases in, in um, greenhouse production. Now, again, like I said, if you've got some powdery mildew and it comes out into your field, it kind of goes away. So most of the time it'll go away completely and me with a hand lens will find it, but it kind of just, it doesn't matter at the field level. Pythium on the other hand will take out a field. And again, if we come out into this environment and that water mold has the water that it needs, it's going to just keep keep infecting and keep reproducing and spreading. So speaking of Pythium, um, when we see fields like this, usually we'll kind of stand out broadly and we'll look for low spots in the field. So with that water mold, with all of this rain we've been getting, those water molds are very happy, especially in those low parts of the field. So as you are looking and scouting in your field, you're looking a lot of times, you'll see those hot spots or those affected areas will start in the low spots of the field. 
and um, I kind of walked a little bit here and I don't see any disease so we can't go on a field trip out here um, I looked really quickly um, and I, I definitely don't want to bring this whole crowd down down the uh, road but so Pythium is a big one that we deal with um, that's our major root rot but there are some other root rots that we see so if any of you know southern blight we're seeing a lot of southern blight it's hot right now it's hot and wet and that's its favorite conditions we see a lot of southern blight or sclerotium rolfsii um, following pasture so if anybody is coming in with hemp behind pasture your risk appear to be much higher because this actual this fungus can infect some of your pasture grasses so that pathogen is already there and 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 it hemp is really susceptible and it really likes hemp so we're seeing a lot of that usually mid-july um the last three years we're seeing more and more of it um, we're also seeing things like web blight so some of you might know web blight or rhizotomia any mom growers here mom growers pretty much know that one so again another one of these diseases that we we see in other crops coming into hemp production um, and then of course there are the leaf spots so we have leaf spots that appear to be some appear to be specific to hemp we don't know where they're coming from if it's your some growers it's their first year growing hemp and somehow these leaf spots appear so we're working on that um it looks like uh the more we know the more we don't know so and then there are some other leaf spots like cercospora leaf spot and the cercospora that we're dealing with is one that affects johnson grass and some of our ubiquitous weeds so they're there these are pathogens that are there we have a septoria leaf spot anybody who knows septoria you know it on our tomatoes we know it on our ornamentals we've got a new species of septoria um, that seems to be specific to um, cannabis species in general, but we don't know where that one comes from, but it's appearing in fields where every single leaf of every single plant is affected. And we, we haven't figured that part out. So there's a lot of research that we need to do. Um, and and we're, we're, we're working on it, we promise. It's just uh, slower than I think a lot of our growers hope. So um, we'll see, we'll see stem, stem diseases. We will see um, bud and stem molds. If it's raining, it, as your plants go to flower, if it's raining, you'll see a lot of molds and, and different fungi come into those heads, whether they're infecting or just colonizing. Um, we see both, but in the end, it kind of doesn't matter because that makes your crop unsellable. Um, so these rainy seasons, what, three years in a row, it's rained all summer and that's not really typical. So. We have to question, you know, how much of this is going to be a problem in the future? How much is not? Not real sure with that yet. So a um, couple of other things about diseases. I put my phone in my pocket so I can watch my time. Okay, I still have lots of time. So a couple of things about uh, plant diseases. They are caused, they can be caused by fungi, by bacteria, by, by viruses, by nematodes. Okay, or those water molds, those oomycetes. So, so a lot of different microorganisms can cause plant disease. Symptoms is what we call disease, but the actual pathogen that's causing it is what we need to see in order to, to diagnose. And if you've got the wrong diagnosis, you can't manage it. So we've got to know, and that's tricky because your agents can go so far, but sometimes they just don't have the equipment to do so. So we, we are here, we run a plant disease diagnostic lab. So when you're working with your, with your hemp problems, you, when you do have a problem, you're going to contact your agent and your agent can go three quarters of the way, sometimes all the way in a diagnosis. If they can't, they will contact us. And um, while I'm here, I do want to say that there are some restrictions in the way we work with hemp. Your agent cannot drive hemp for you. So if you have a problem, your agent can come to your field and work with you. If that sample, maybe that, maybe Macy wants to take it back to her office to look at it under her microscope, you've got to follow her to the office because she can't drive it for you. And then if she deems it has to come to Lexington, well then once again, you have to drive it to Lexington or you have to bring it to the post office to put it in the mail. We apologize, it's not our rule, but that's the way it is. So. So you have to work through your county agent, but then you have to be that transportation. So it's it's frustrating a little bit. We're working on that. Um, but really, I think putting it in the mail is the easiest part, but your agent will guide you through. There are forms to fill out. There's a lot of information that, um, 
that he or she will ask you for, please be patient. We will get, we will get it. We will work with you, and from there you will get a um, you will get a report back. That being said, most of what you're going to see will not be disease. So the first thing someone pointed out to me when I walked out here, those, those uh, stunted plants down here, those are not diseased plants. And Dr. Villanueva is somewhere. He's going to talk about those in a minute. Um, but so not everything is disease. Just because it doesn't look good doesn't mean it's disease. And that's what we're, that's where we're all working together. Uh, Tom and Bob and, and Rick and um, Raul and um, my department, we've got to all work together to try to tease out what's wrong. Um, we see symptoms, a lot of our symptoms look alike. What we see back there was a suspect disease. You can suspect nutrient deficiencies or, or just any abiotic stress, weather, a lot of these things look the same. So um, really important that that's where your agent comes in and helps you sort through. Um, also as a grower, so what I would not do out here today, but I would if you called me in, is dig up plants. I know you're paying $4 or more for one of these plugs, but if we're going to diagnose, if we can't, if it's not a, an easy leaf spot, we've got to dig these plants up. We're going to look at the roots. We're going to cut those stems lengthways to see if you've got, well, the entomologist may look for a borer or I may look for some stem rot we will destroy three to five plants in that process. And at four bucks a piece, I know that, I know that that's kind of hard. So that's another one of kind of the, um, one of the steps is that as we examine, we have to look at the whole plant. So you would bring, for instance, a whole plant into the diagnostic lab. You would bring that root ball in there. Um, your agent may or may not run a quick um, soil test, depending on what they do in their, um, in their office, they may actually want to come out and help you run a soil test on your whole field. Hopefully you will have done that already, but if not helping you do that, but then we'll start looking, we'll look at the roots, we'll examine those roots, we'll examine that plant. So again, it may or may not be a disease issue, but the plant's pretty much toast when we finish with it. So um, I just kind of wanted to say that we, <laughs> we have some growers that are not willing to willing to go that far and it's harder and harder as the season goes on and the plants get bigger and you think that's a pound and a half of floral material and you want to destroy it <laughs> so um so anyway part of the diagnostic process and diagnostics i'm kind of generalizing not just disease diagnostics but diagnostics overall um if it's not something really blatant and, and easy which they're rarely easy right then we, we will have to start um start breaking it down little by little so any questions? Anybody here have hemp and have encountered disease at all? No? I got a question. Sure. I got the drip line. And you're talking about too much moisture to get disease. Right. When did we irrigate this? Oh, so his question was, is they're talking about nutrition running through drip lines. When do you irrigate? Well, personally, as a plant pathologist, I don't like to see fertigation because when it's raining, you still have to irrigate to get the fertility out there. And if you do have an outbreak of one of the root rots, for instance, then that, that will just um, accelerate disease, disease development and disease spread. And, and again, those root rots being a, a water hole, so they run. So if you get a downpour and you've got running water, it'll take those, those um, fungal spores with it and it'll move it down. So yeah, so it's really it's really kind of like juggling all these pieces, right? Yeah. If it was a drought year or a normal year, then it would be fine. Can it handle the dry weather? Can hemp handle the dry weather? Yes, once it's established, but Tom Keen back there is actually the one to, to have that extensive conversation. But yeah, so anybody who's growing in a greenhouse or even if you're if you're irrigating out here or you're fertigating then you are balancing, in fact, that risk of that wet soil, not just because hemp doesn't like wet feet, but also these, these waterborne diseases that go with it, balance with that need to put that, um, that fertilizer out there. So, so yeah, so it's all just like farming. This is farming in a nutshell. You're balancing all these pieces and most of the time it doesn't, it doesn't really work, right? <laughs> just when you think you've got it figured out, you don't. So, um, so yeah, think about, think about water. So plant diseases are water driven. 
So water can be the rain, water can be humidity, water can be soil moisture. You're in a greenhouse, there's lots of humidity in a greenhouse, but water and cooler temperatures most of the time or moderate temperature. This is a great day right now anyway, right? Because I like to say if you're comfortable, pretty much your pathogen is comfortable. When it gets really hot, there are very few diseases that are active. But when you get these rainy overcast days, now I hear this afternoon won't be quite so cool, but if you've got a day like this, three days in a row like this, this is just enough for a lot of your dormant or inactive pathogens to wake up and to start, to start infecting and to start producing spores. A typical fungus will produce spores in seven days. So if you've got, if you've got a rainy week, you can really go through a complete life cycle and one fungal propagule can become a million in just a few weeks. And then again, a picture of a rain or, or dirty feet spreading that. So um, soil borne pathogens are attached to soil. So anywhere soil moves, I know my feet are already muddy. So you're moving those things if you're cultivating and you cultivate from an infected part of the field into a, um, into a clean part of the field, you're dragging those propagules with you. You have a greenhouse, um, you're using foot baths. So you're not taking propagules from outside under your shoes in. You're sanitizing everything, you're disinfesting. That's everything from your wheelbarrow to your, your trowels to pots if you reuse pots. So all of those things really matter. Any other questions? Do you recommend a crop rotation? What crop in front of? Okay, so his question was, do I recommend a crop rotation? Um, yes, but I don't know what yet. So we're still we're still working that out. I'm still just kind of collecting information on, um, you know, whether some of these diseases can directly follow a crop. Was that previous crop infected? So you'll see it when you start communicating with us, if you have a problem, we'll ask you. I mean, we interrogate you, right? We wanna know what you planted before and we wanna know all the details and that's kind of helping us learn if your previous crop may have been harboring a, a particular disease or not. Or sometimes it may just blow in. So some fungal spores blow in the air. So is that septoria leaf spot, for instance, blowing in or, or not, but like your southern blight is not blowing, it's a soil board. So we, we're trying to tease all those parts apart. So I don't have a lot of answers there. So I could tell you all the problems, but we're not real sure on the details of some of this management. Uh, but crop rotations are always a good idea across the board from, um, from overall plant health to disease management, um, pest management. So crop rotations are always a really good idea. But I'm seeing that pasture is not a good one, <laughs> or not, not for one particular disease anyway. Um, and it depends with the health of that previous crop. What about weeds? Your weeds in your previous crop will carry on to the next year as well. And speaking of weeds, so weeds will harbor disease. So a weedy field can very well become, uh, those weeds can become a green bridge from season to season and can, can hold that disease. Sometimes not as severe, but it'll hold, it'll harbor enough of those, for instance, fungal spores that they can jump the next year. So weed control really does matter to insect and disease management, as well as from the fertility standpoint. Um, also, then we, we can talk about how our disciplines overlap. There are um, some insects that carry viruses. They, they vector viruses. So once you start having these complexes in there, then it would be the pathologist and the entomologist having the discussion on how to manage these complexes. But again, that, that's really typical of a lot of your, your crops, not just this one. Other questions? Uh, cedar rust, are they, are these plants susceptible to cedar rust? Or whatever? The question was cedar rust or cedar apple rust? Okay. No, cedar apple rust is host specific, so it will only affect um, your apple and, and the juniper species. But they're, um, yeah, that's one you don't have. And there's supposed to be a rust on hemp. I've never seen it. Um, so we, so I have a website, kyhempdisease.com. And I try to put some of this information on there. So if you wanna catch that, um, it'll kind of give you some ideas. I'm a little bit slow in updating it, but there's some solid um, uh, fundamental information on there for you to kind of understand some of these disease cycles. What about 
about a month into harvest and you start to see some yellowing in the leaves. Is that a, is that a fertilizer issue or a stress of plants? Or a so, so the question was, if you start seeing yellow leaves, if you're about a month into a month before harvest, as you get closer to harvest, you will see yellowing leaves. Whether it's a nutrition issue or not, that would be a that would be something that your agent or or Tom could help you work through. Usually at that point, if you start seeing disease, it's going to affect you less. It's going to affect yield less, depending on which one it is. But you will definitely see as those plants start start to nesting and approaching harvest, then you will see some diseases moving in. So you can find lots of leaf spots and and different necrosis on leaves as we get closer. But those are more um, either either minor diseases that are just on those stressed plants, or it might be something like a um, like a decomposer. As those plants are dying, they're just kind of in there to decompose. We call those saprophytes. So not necessarily a bad thing, but we would have to evaluate each of those individually. And so um, our growers are learning, our agents are learning, our specialists are learning. So we would kind of we would take that that uh, case by case, hopefully it would just be a, a natural senescence as you go. Anybody doing float trays? Anybody growing in float trays or got in float trays? Okay, I wanna just make a really quick comment, especially for those who are not growing yet. Don't float your hemp, okay? I kinda of said that in the beginning. Tom said that a minute ago. Hemp doesn't like wet feet and float beds are a magnet for pythium root rot. Uh, the pythium pathogen. So you're not going to float your hemp. You're never ever going to reuse float trays. So some people are using float trays on benches and they're just using them for the tray. You're not reusing float trays either because all those little holes in between those styrofoam beads are locking in some of these fungal spores and you can't properly clean them. So if you are going to use trays of any kind, make sure it's a plastic tray or something that you can actually wash and you are going to wash and disinfest um, So if you're gonna reuse. So a lot of the literature will tell you not to reuse, but you can reuse if you wash properly. Um, but, but yeah, be very careful of tobacco float trays. That's kind of the number one, um, the number one culprit when we start seeing early season plant disease. It's usually dirty, dirty trays that have just brought disease from one season to the next or from one crop to the next. 